Welcome to the UNC Core Center for Clinical Research Speaker Series. We appreciate you joining us for today's talk. Our presenter today is Dr. Ted Michaels, a professor of rheumatology, the vice chair of research, and the director of the National Institute of General Medical Sciences, Great Plains Institutional Development Award, Clinical and Translation Research Professional Development Program at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. That was a lot. Um, there's quite a few acronyms in there that I wanted to make sure I said to everybody. So his presentation today is titled the VARA Registry, a platform for early career investigators. Dr. Michaels, whenever you're ready to start, feel free. Thank you, Council. Um, so it's a pleasure to join everybody today virtually here from Omaha, Nebraska, uh, where I am at the University of Nebraska Med Center and the VA Nebraska Western Iowa Healthcare Center, the Omaha VA, where I spend um, quite a bit of my time. It's, I want to give my appreciation for the invitation from Dr. Callahan and Council for all the help she's given up front. And it's always a pleasure for me to be able to give, be given the opportunity to talk about two of my academic passions, one being uh, research training and the other being uh, research uh, in rheumatoid arthritis, which is uh, where I've spent a majority of my academic time uh, since the early 2000s. So my disclosures, just briefly today, I want to give an outline of what I'm going to talk about. I was going to give the audience a brief introduction to rheumatoid arthritis. I see Beth Jonas is on. Is on. My apologies, Beth, to you for having to live through this again. But um, And then I want to speak about mentoring networks and rheumatology research and how we've been able to transition what really is a cohort study, an observational cohort study, into what I think has been a successful network for research mentoring for trainees interested in rheumatology research. And I wanna provide some hands-on examples or some examples of hands-on research training that our trainees have been able to do over the years. So just as a brief introduction for those of you who don't live rheumatoid arthritis day-to-day, uh, -day, rheumatoid arthritis is a complex systemic autoimmune disease that really has an unknown etiology at present, although we're learning more and more about how this disease uh, initiates. Um, it is a, a disease not only of joints, but it has common extra articular manifestations. And I show a picture below of lungs from a patient with rheumatoid arthritis associated interstitial, interstitial lung disease. So this disease, while very manageable, uh, can be devastating in some. It has a prevalence that's often quoted as high as 1%, but I think typically uh, somewhat lower than that. It is a female predominant disease. Uh, and about two thirds uh, to 80% of patients are women. It's become a very expensive condition to have with direct lifetime costs that exceed that of diabetes. And I think that really very quickly puts this condition in perspective in terms of societal costs. It has both environmental and genetic risk factors like many of these chronic condi conditions we are exploring. And importantly, it's, re it's associated with reduced survival and increased uh, functional disability. So this is the timeline that uh, is conventionally taught in medical schools in regards to rheumatoid arthritis. And in the upper left at five months of disease, you can see a typical patient with synovitis or swelling involving small joints. And it's often a very symmetrical arthritis. And I think it's really quite pronounced in this patient's PIP joints, uh, um, in the second and third PIP joints. With time, when treated inadequately, this arthritis can lead to destructive changes and deformities. You can begin to see that in this patient at five years disease duration with marked uh, ulnar deviation of the fingers and palmar subluxation. And you begin to see what we've called swan necking uh, deformities in some of the fingers. And this patient actually also has rheumatoid nodules over the extensor surface of multiple fingers. And then with more advanced untreated disease, you can even see um, highly destructive changes shown below here. This is a patient with arthritis mutilans or a completely destructive form of rheumatoid arthritis. And this uh, bottom patient is actually a patient I had the privilege of caring for in the VA, obviously very late into his disease process. Uh, he was a medic in the Korean War uh, and you know, had this to deal with in terms of arthritis. 
and I never show this slide without showing the, the clipping, the newspaper clipping above that shows um, this patient, the bottom right patient, uh, his third hole in one that he'd scored uh, 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 while golfing, obviously, his uh, favorite pastime. And I think, um, you know, patients teach us a lot uh, in, about academics and research, but boy, they teach us a lot about resilience too. And I, I think that's uh, more true perhaps in rheumatoid arthritis than other conditions that I have the privilege of caring for. So a lot has been written about uh, gender or biologic sex differences in rheumatoid arthritis. And one example of that is in the context of mortality. So I mentioned earlier that rheumatoid arthritis is associated with an increased mortality. And these are results from a study from the Mayo Clinic now several years ago showing a, a survival differences in patients with rheumatoid arthritis and the general population spanning from the 1970s into the early 2000s. And what you can see in both sexes is what's often termed to as a mortality gap or reduced survival in the context of rheumatoid arthritis. When you look closer at these lines, if anything, particularly in men, that gap appears, at least by the mid-2000s, to be widening, not narrowing. And that's somewhat unexpected, particularly given the advances in therapy that we've experienced with the emergence of the biologic era beginning in the late 1990s. So other, others have approached this biologic sex difference as well, and this is an Olmsted County study, that's another Mayo Clinic study, showing that there appear to be phenotypic differences between men and women um, with rheumatoid arthritis, with men having more erosive disease, more severe destructive disease, they appear to have earlier onset disease and have a higher frequency of interstitial lung disease, which is particularly important as patients with RA, ILD have been reported to have a median survival as short as five to seven years. In a very intriguing study that was published uh, now about 15 years ago, men appeared to be more likely to be seropositive or to have higher concentrations of disease-related autoantibodies Again, important since these autoantibodies portend a worse outcome in our patients. So if you were going to study men and study rheumatoid arthritis, where would you go? And I think you don't have to think long as a trainee in the United States to really turn to the VA as a possible source for research material in that population. And so the VA, I think many of you are highly familiar with the VA based on your training. But the VA includes 1,400 integrated hospitals across the U.S., nursing homes and clinics, and employs about 15,000 phys physicians. And about 70% of U.S. physicians have had some training in the VA. And annually, and this number has grown a bit recently, but the VA provides care for about 5 million veterans. And importantly for our research, the VA really has been a pioneer in the development of the electronic health record. And we've been able to leverage that. And I'll show uh, some of our work leveraging what the VA has been able to do in terms of the electronic health record. So the VA um, is often subject to press that maybe isn't uh, entirely favorable. But I just point out the VA has a long, long track record in high impact research. And this is, I'm not going to read this list, but you can look at this. Uh, some pretty impressive things that have happened at the VA. And some of those have even include, include large uh, multi-center studies in rheumatoid arthritis that we've recently published. But also, you know, things like the first liver transplant, uh, development of endoscopic uh, approaches, um, Nobel Prize uh, winners, uh, development of things like the nicotine patch, et cetera. And I guess one of the things that I think that's always very, very important to point out for those who do research in the VA or are contemplating it is part and parcel to all these research efforts are the VA patients. And the VA patients are really notorious for high uh, uh, participation rates. Um, it's, it's really quite amazing. And my own take on that is this is really an opportunity, if you will, to extend a service from military service into patient service, if you will, or participant service. 
So it was in that context that we began to think about the development of a registry in the, in the VA in the early 2000s, which we called at that time and still call the VA Rheumatoid Arthritis or VERA registry. And our goal at the time was really to establish and maintain a national clinical and a biologic repository that would facilitate investigator initiated research and ultimately that would help us learn about how to better take care of veterans with rheumatoid arthritis. And over time, although not part of our initial goal, increasingly we recognize the ability of VERA or the capacity of this registry to serve as a training platform for, for people interested in research. So part of our goal it clearly has become, become to provide a training platform for individuals interested in rheumatoid arthritis research. I think when you begin to think about this, you know, one of the questions we had early on is mentoring and how we would handle mentoring for young investigators and maybe even junior faculty who lacked local mentors, how we would handle that, you know, for a multi-center registry across the country. And I think like many of you, this has been my traditional thinking about mentoring perhaps until recently. And that's this, you know, traditional hierarchical dyad where the, you know, smarter, wiser, older uh, supervisor shown on the right provides knowledge or disseminates knowledge in this unidirectional flow to the younger protege. And obviously, um, you know, your center has been uh, at the at a lead in a lead role of thinking about different mentoring models. <laughs> And I think the mentoring network or, you know, the it takes a village approach has been something uh, that has really been uh, put out there more and more in the literature. And it's not necessarily a new idea, but the mentoring network is really an expanded vision of mentoring. And it's a team-based approach and often really referred to as team mentoring that might include senior faculty and importantly, peer mentoring or horizontal mentoring, but also community members and others multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary teams of individuals who can provide mentoring. And I just point to one of many studies that I could cite here, but there's a very nice qualitative study done by DeCastro and colleagues a few years ago um, where they conducted semi-structured interviews with 100 different NIHK awardees. So, uh, you know, arguably uh, trainees who have had at least some success in grant uh, uh, applications. And the dominant themes that emerged from that work were really the importance of mentors who facilitated networking, really an important, a critical key uh, for these hundred uh, 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 grant awardees. Also, another theme that emerged was the improbability of finding a single mentor who could do it all, and the importance of t a team of mentors to satisfy the diverse needs that, uh, that, tip, that a trainee typically has. So when you think about this, and you think about this in rheumatology, you know, I think about many, many cohort studies over time that have served as a platform for mentoring networks. And really maybe even before that term was vogue. Um, and you know, this is just a few of the cohorts that have been leveraged for high impact rheumatology research over the years. And one of the things you see in all of these cohorts is they've all been transitioned into, into mentoring networks. And as a young trainee in the early 2000s, when I was still at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, uh, working with Ken Sag there as my primary mentor, I was lucky enough to be plugged into a mentoring network. Again, didn't have that name, but it clearly was a mentoring network uh, as part of rheumatology-based studies using the Iowa Women's Health Study. The Iowa Women's Health Study was a cohort study initially designed to examine dietary risk factors for the development of breast cancer. And we leveraged that resource to study outcomes and uh, risk of developing rheumatoid arthritis. And I was able to very quickly as a young trainee plug in with dietary experts, statisticians, epidemiologists really from around the country, from Mayo Clinic, from UCSF, from UAB and elsewhere, and to really learn uh, uh, about study design and conducting a study using a data source like this. 
So that is a model we really thought about as we have developed the Vera registry. And we started the Vera registry actually in 2003. The first patient, patient was a, a enrolled at the Omaha VA in January of 2003. And we very quickly grew to involve other VA centers across the country with the Washington DC VA probably being the closest uh, to you all, but also involving uh, folks in Salt Lake City, Dallas, Denver, and Jackson, Mississippi. And within about five years, we had 1,200 patients enrolled into the registry. The registry has grown over the years. And uh, I show a map here. Um, the map on the right is a heat map basically showing zip codes of registrants that we have in the Vera registry. And it's interesting that the geographic ground that the registry covers, despite um, you know, the centers being somewhat remote. It really speaks to the catchment area we see, particularly in the Western US uh, for, for many of our sites. So when we enrolled actually our 3,000th patient into the registry um, a few months ago, um, and we're up to uh, a little over 3,000 now. And what you'll see um, by looking at the left-hand map, this is a map, a heat map of VA patients with rheumatoid arthritis diagnostic codes nationally. And you really can appreciate that the Vera Registry, it really represents a sub-cohort, if you will, of this national population. And the national VA data set is actually something uh, that we have leveraged uh, quite a bit uh, in our work with the registry, and I'll, I'll point to that uh, momentarily. So this is what our uh, registry looks like now. And you can see over the years, we've continued to grow, which has really, I think, been a key to our success given the attrition that you see with a registry in the VA, given the age and comorbidities that we see in our patient population. We currently have 15 active VA sites. We have two sites that have been deactivated uh, with uh, move, moves of PIs, and we have three prospective sites that are currently in the IRB process. But really um, excellent geographic uh, uh, representation across the United States. You can notice we're missing a dot in the state of North Carolina, and that's a, that's a deficiency we'd love to address at some point if we can. So what is Vera? So Vera really is a database that collects data as part of routine clinical care for patients who are diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. It's a fairly simple concept. At baseline, uh, we collect disease characteristics, sociodemographics, health behaviors, a very limited data set that goes uh, into our uh, Vera database. And then longitudinally, we collect core disease activity measures um, that are recommended by the American College of Rheumatology for follow-up in rheumatoid arthritis patients. And to date, we have about 30,000 observations in the database with an average follow-up that now uh, is getting close to about five years follow-up. And one of the key things that we've been able to accomplish is that all of our Vera data is automatically abstracted from text notes so we all use clinical templates in our clinic, and those templates get populated with disease activity measures, and those disease activity measures are automatically pulled out of those notes using natural language processing. So there's absolutely zero manual data entry for our follow-up, which makes us really an attractive uh, uh, potential for many sites. So about the time we were developing this registry, um, I was fortunate enough to uh, uh, be at a talk that was given by Peter Gregerson, who is a pretty famous geneticist in, in the rheumatology world. And he had this quote that he said, if you develop a bioassay, you're a beggar, but if you develop a biorepository, you're the king. And you know, that's a pretty e easy proposition to choose between those. Um, if you wanna be a beggar or a king, I certainly, I think, would choose king. So when we thought through the Vera registry, you know, we wanted to have the ability to ask additional questions, to ask important questions, translational questions. And so one of the things that we did, I think that was a very good decision in retrospect, 
was to tie the Vera database to a fairly simplistic biorepository. And so what we did is we collected serum, plasma, and DNA at the time of enrollment into the registry, so a one-time collection. And those uh, uh, biomaterials are sent to the Omaha VA where they're banked. Um, we also have taken advantage of these samples to create a standardized data set for measures that are really integral to rheumatoid arthritis studies. So we have measured autoantibodies in a centralized, standardized way. We've done HLA-DRV1 status on the entire VA VERA cohort. Um, we also, I want to point out, we've made this as pragmatic as humanly possible. So blood is drawn only at the uh, typically, um, with rare exceptions, at the time of a routine clinical blood draw to reduce cost and to reduce patient burden. And that's really been a key to making this a success. So very early on, we had a vision that, you know, with time, it would obviously be advantageous to be able to link Vera with national VA data. So the VA, if they do one thing well, it's they collect data well on their patients. So there's an extensive, very rich amount of clinical and demographic data available for all of the veterans who uh, receive care in the VA. And this was a really a vision shared with Grant Cannon, who was a PI at the Salt Lake City VA. And this was an early paper that we published in Arthritis Care and Research in 2011, basically that did just that. So what we did in this study is we merged the VERA data with, with administrative data, and particularly pharmacy dispensing data, and we were able to show the importance of adherence to treatments in rheumatoid arthritis with disease activity outcomes. And it's a pretty intuitive finding, but for us it was really a um, deal breaker in terms of how we could approach research with this registry. So as I mentioned, we've been able to make this triad of, of VERA resources. So a biorepository, routine clinical and demographic data that are collected over time, linked with robust data linkage. And that includes administrative data, but also other VA data sets that include things like the VA Central Cancer Registry, so we can look at incident cancer risk, um, death data, from the National Death Index, so we can look at vital status and cause of death over time. And all of that gets loaded into the VA Informatics and Computing Infrastructure, or termed Vinci. And Vinci really is a secure web-based framework that provides a secure environment for data merging, for data analysis, and analytics. Um, and, and really has is, is been a, a robust platform for analyzing all of this data. So early on, I just want to give an example of how we've used this, this multiple data sources, merging those to ask questions about uh, veterans with rheumatoid arthritis. And this was a study, again, that we published in 2011, just looking at survival risk, all-cause mortality, and correlates of all-cause mortality. And we showed um, some, again, somewhat intuitive findings. Rheumatoid arthritis um, is associated with a more than two-fold risk of mortality in veterans, um, you know, similar to what had been published in other cohorts. We see higher mortality risk with more evidence of inflammation we see a protective effect of methotrexate use, which is really a cornerstone drug in the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. And we see higher mortality risk with the use of steroid therapies. Again, observations that have been shared with others. One of the interesting findings was this, what appeared to be an obesity paradox in rheumatoid arthritis. And that is that the highest mortality risk in rheumatoid arthritis is really among these underweight individuals or individuals with BMIs at the time of enrollment of less than 20 uh, 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 kgs per meter squared. And that had been reported in other populations. And it was about that time that Josh Baker, who was a junior investigator at the time, 
joined the Vera Network from the Philadelphia VA. Josh has a dual appointment. Many of you may know Josh. Josh has a dual appointment at the University of Pennsylvania. He joined Vera in 2012, and his interest, and he had a K award at the time, was really in this complex interplay between body composition, body habitus, and rheumatoid arthritis outcomes. And what Josh did that was very clever, I think, and again, somewhat intuitive, was to ask the question, is there really an obesity paradox in rheumatoid arthritis, or is this really a measure of what's happened longitudinally over time? And Josh did a fairly simple, conceptually simple analysis where he examined maximum BMI and the current BMI. And again, he found that these underweight individuals are at the higher, are at higher risk um, for mortality, but that this really appeared to be driven by weight loss preceding that measurement. So in other words, those who had a maximal BMI consistent with obesity, and then who found their way into the underweight category were really driving the risk that we saw in the underweight population. And Josh published these observations in arthritis and rheumatology in 2015. I've been fortunate enough to serve as a mentor along with several other of the senior investigators in the VERA consortium of Josh. And just in, since 2012, Josh has had 26 VERA publications with 55 different co-authors, speaking really, I think, to the power of transitioning a cohort study such as VERA into a mentoring network, at least for Josh. Josh has uh, run in different areas um, in his work. And this is interesting data that he's recently looked at uh, examining inflammation and diabetes risk in rheumatoid arthritis. On those baseline samples, those biobank samples, we have run um, a uh, cytokine array. And this current array that we did on the entire cohort almost 3,000 veterans, includes 33 different chemokine and cytokine analytes. And what you're seeing here are hazard ratios for the development of diabetes based on several different analytes. And you can see uh, many of these analytes show strong associations with the development of diabetes. And indeed, in that paper, he showed that disease activity, also a risk factor, uh, you know, based on joint counts, and composite, composite measures showing associations of inflammation uh, with the risk of developing diabetes. And this is important since diabetes is a major risk factor for cardiovascular disease and obviously number one uh, uh, killer of patients with rheumatoid arthritis. So Josh has been able to, to transition his early work in Vera into a, a, a VA a merit grant, which is really the, the R01 equivalent in the VA. And at least part of that work will be focused on the VERA consortium exam, examining adiponectin, leptin, and FGF. These are all metabolic biomarkers with, in terms of associations with rheumatoid arthritis outcomes. And so we're currently working with Josh uh, on this analysis. Part of his work has involved obtaining um, whole genome data, which we just currently completed and now have available for this entire cohort. So I wanna speak, turn a little bit to the VERA consortium really as this uh, mentoring network. And I'm showing really what I would refer to as one spoke in this, this network. And so, there are several senior investigators uh, similar to me, um, similar levels um, uh, in their career as myself. And I'm just showing really one spoke. And I've, as I mentioned, fortunate enough to begin serving as a mentor, co-mentor, colleague of Dr. Baker's uh, starting in 2011, 2012, when he joined the VERA network. And he published the paper looking at the obesity paradox and about that same time, Dr. England, uh, Brian England is currently an assistant professor at UNMC, and I have been charged with his mentoring. And about that time, uh, the, two of, uh, the two of them, Dr. Baker and Dr. England, met at our annual VERA meeting and began to talk research. 
and talk about the obesity paradox. And Bryant had been very interested in the time at looking at cause-specific mortality risk in rheumatoid arthritis. And a natural product of that peer mentoring and sharing that happened between those two led to this article I'm showing on the right in Arthritis Care and Research, examining associations of body mass index and weight loss over time with cause-specific mortality. And interesting in that paper, Dr. England showed um, that this weight loss and, and absolute weight at any given time seemed to have a differential effect uh, depending on the cause of death, uh, which was an intriguing finding and the only time I, I believe to date that that's been reported. So since those initial interactions, Dr. Baker and Dr. Lingen have now shared 18 co-authored publications and that's impressive given both are still very early in their career. Dr. England is I believe in his fourth year uh, of faculty position. They both now co-lead what's called our Vera DAG or our uh, data analysis group and both now are on the Vera executive committee. So it's been, it's been fun to watch that growth and that collaboration um, in the next generation. So Dr. England has really um, taken advantage of the VA uh, population in many ways. He's very interested in extraarticular disease in rheumatoid arthritis. And you recall from the earlier slide I showed that ILD is probably three times more common in men than women with rheumatoid arthritis. So to study ILD, the VA in many ways offers you know, a, a unique and ideal pop study population. So in quick order, in the last four years, Dr. England, in addition to getting his PhD in clinical translational research, he's shown that respiratory disease is the most overrepresented cause of death in rheumatoid arthritis. And he's shown counter uh, to uh, conventional wisdom that methotrexate appears to be safe in these patients, even patients with chronic lung disease. He's identified novel biomarkers for RILD, and he's developed a claims-based algorithm that's accurate in identifying patients with RILD, which is important because it really opens the door for other health services and outcomes researchers to examine these important questions. So, Dr. England recently was able to, again, leverage VERA for a career development award in the VA, and he just got notice of funding um, a few weeks ago on that. And these are his two study aims. Aim one, looking at whether biomarkers can predict progression in patients with RAILD, which is important given the current availability of novel, novel therapies that are really targeting patients with progressive disease phenotypes. And then AIM-2 is a really a classic pharmacoepi study looking at the safety and potential efficacy of RA-related treatments in patients with ILD. One of the things that uh, Dr. England did that was, I think, quite clever in his CDA application is he included a network of co-authors in his early publications and showed the VA role, research roles of some of these different links in his network. And this is just one of the comments he got from his uh, critique. And he had similar comments on a, a simultaneous K23 application. But one of their viewers made the comment, the infrastructure and collaborative environment available to this applicant are excellent. And those are the kind of comments, obviously, you want to see in the mentoring section of such a career development award. So back to this network and building it further. So it's been really gratifying for me to see that Dr. Baker and Dr. England have both moved on as mentors in their own right. And I've just included partial lists of some of the trainees that these two have been able to mentor. And what's really interesting is these are not just trainees at UNMC for Dr. England or trainees uh, for Dr. Baker at UPenn or the Philadelphia VA but involve trainees. Carolyn McCauley is a trainee at the University of Oregon. Luke Desolate is actually a University of Nebraska Med Center trainee. Um, and you see similar uh, crossover in uh, mentoring that Dr. England has performed. So these two, along with myself, and again, many others who are involved in the Vera Registry, not just the three of us, have been heavily involved in peer mentoring and co-mentoring and this is a list of investigators who I would include as beneficiaries of some of that mentoring that's happened. 
And I was going to point out uh, work from two of those uh, junior investigators, Katie Weisham, who's an assistant professor at the University of Washington and has an appointment at the Puget Sound VA, and Beth Wallace, who is at the University of Michigan and with an appointment at the Ann Arbor VA, and point to some of their work and early successes in rheumatoid arthritis-related research. So Katie Weisham uh, is very interested in looking at frailty and how uh, frailty measures play out in outcomes related to rheumatoid arthritis, and specifically the complex interplay of inflammation with frailty, osteoporosis, and osteoporosis leading to fracture and fracture risk. And so she actually has recently submitted a career development award similar to the award that Dr. England uh, recently was notified on. And her aims are, are really outlined in this figure uh, shown on the right with a study title of her project, Frailty, BMD, and Osteoporotic Fractures in Veterans with Rheumatoid Arthritis. And again, one of the advantages here is that, rheumat is that osteoporosis as an extra-articular manifestation really has been subject to very limited study in populations such as those you'd see in the VA with you know, a, a population that is predominantly male and older. So Dr. Weisham has you know, collected her own mentoring team, and here's the mentoring team that was included in her application. And you'll recognize many of these uh, folks, including Patty Katz, who was a mentor during Dr. Weisham's training uh, when she was at UCSF, but also includes Dr. Baker um, from the Vera Registry, which is uh, fantastic uh, to see but other um, really multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary team that she's brought to bear to, that I think is appropriate to study the complex questions she hopes to tackle. Beth Wallace has had similar early success in leveraging Vera for early uh, career work and developing pilot data that she also hopes to turn into career development applications. Um, again, she's from the Ann Arbor VA and the University of Michigan, and her interests have really focused on glucocorticoid use in the context of rheumatoid arthritis and how glucocorticoid use may, might influence different health outcomes for our patients. And I'm showing you a study on the right, um, an initial study that she has performed looking at chronic or long-term glucocorticoid use and the risk of major uh, uh, acute coronary events or cardiovascular events in rheumatoid arthritis. Again, important since cardiovascular events are, are, are represent one of the more common causes of death or the most common cause of death in rheumatoid arthritis and are overrepresented in rheumatoid arthritis. Basically, in her study, which she will present as a podium presentation at the virtual ACR convergence that happens next month, she showed again that, as others have shown, that glucocorticoid use is associated with increased cardiovascular events uh, in rheumatoid arthritis. But what she showed that I think is somewhat unique and, and, and definitely adds uh, to the ongoing conversation with regards to glucocorticoid use is the apparent interaction of steroid use with known cardiovascular risk factors. So what she showed is that long-term steroid use seems to be particularly deleterious in patients with diabetes, maybe not surprising, but also patients who smoke or patients who enter observation with a history of cardiovascular disease. And she shows these different uh, odds ratios associated with that um, uh, shown in this uh, table on the bottom right here. So we've been able to extend the mentoring network, if you will, and the data that's available uh, to Vera to not only junior faculty, but we've been able to extend that to medical students and res medical residents and fellows across the country. And so um, somewhere around 50% of our uh, publications, we've had about 100 publications, so about 50 of those have come with trainees as lead authors. So you know, it's an, it's an impressive uh, list. This is a recent study from Peter Maloli, 
Um, I felt obligated to show this as Peter told me last week he was going to go into rheumatology. So I was excited for him and he, he made his way into my talk. So Peter was very interested in looking at, at associations of post-traumatic stress disorder with the inflammatory burden in rheumatoid arthritis. And this is something our group has previously published on. But what Peter did was he leveraged the biomarker data that we had generated with the cytok multiplex cytokine array and simply asked the question, are cytokines elevated in patients with comorbid PTSD? And very interestingly, Peter showed that patients with PS PTSD are indeed more likely to harbor higher cytokine and chemokine concentrations. And that seemed to be particularly true in seropositive patients. So Peter is currently working on a follow-up uh, to that study and uh, hopefully will be presenting work, not this year, but at next year's uh, ACR meeting that outlines some of the work that he's been uh, uh, undergoing. So we've obviously, um, Vera has been important for trainees to help build them, build their CV, to get early publications and presentations. But there are obviously other ways of measuring success. And as a director of our professional development core for NIGMS uh, funded uh, uh, CTR or infrastructure uh, building grant, you know, we're very interested in, in competencies and in helping people develop competency in clinical translational research. And there are many ways to think about competencies in research. And this is one paper that outlines different domains of competency. And I just show those here. I won't read the list. But I think when I think about VERA, I think we've been particularly successful in helping trainees work through many of these competencies. And I think some of these are part and parcel to really any research like problem assessment study design and measurement, et cetera. But one of the things we have really, uh, I think, been successful at is helping trainees develop their skills in terms of performance of translational teamwork and building teams. And we'll step back a little bit and think a bit more about that. So how do we do that? And how do we translate a collaborative consortium like Vera, or how would we do this with maybe an OA initiative or other collaborative um, uh, cohort study that we might have. I think there are several keys to that. One is engaging senior investigators who are committed to mentoring. And I don't know that that was as purposeful decision in the early, early 2000s as it was luck. But we were lucky in that our early group of investigators also happened to be senior investigators who were very interested in training the next generation of rheumatologists. So that's something to really think about as you identify collaborators, I think for any of these type of multi-center projects that you hope to use as a mentoring platform. One of the keys is providing data access and know-how. And while that seems intuitive, I think it's often an overlooked step. So one of the things we've done is we've made data access very simple. So accessing uh, Vera data sets is really simple as a click on our, uh, on, on our web secure platform. So it's quite easy to get data access. Now merging data with national data does take some skills, but we have worked towards making a, a basically uniform data set that merges important data elements from administrative data and other national data sets to make those readily available for trainees. So no SQL programmer required. I think as a group, if you want to do this, you need to prioritize trainee-led research. And what I mean by that is all things being equal when people are competing for the same resources those that are helping to mentor or train the next generation need to go higher in the priority list. And that's something our executive committee and our scientific ethics and advisory committee are, are well informed on. You need to provide opportunities for regular interactions and data sharing. And one of the things we've done that I think has really been, you know, fairly simplistic, but really important to our success has been our group meets annually uh, in person until this year 
uh, in Omaha for an investigator meeting. That's all we have found ways to get that funded so we don't put the burden back on the investigator. And that's been a really key to moving things along. This year we obviously met virtually and I was happy to say it actually uh, seemed to go fairly well virtually. We've engaged scientists from other disciplines. We have engaged pulmonologists and informaticians, and we have engaged psychiatrists and cardiologists and others. And that's really, I think, been a key to, to maximizing the translation of research, not only for the faculty, but for the trainees who are involved. And we've really fostered peer mentoring. So at our national investigator group this year, just as an example, we had a breakout that was led by trainees where they provided examples of how they've used Vera successfully for mentored research. And I think that's, so we've really pushed that uh, peer mentoring or horizontal mentoring. So I wanna end by just pointing out that this can work for other programs. So we have really, you know, as the director for our professional development core for the Great Plains Idea CTR, this is a consortium, by the way, of eight uh, institutions across the Midwest. And we uh, were funded by NIGMS, and I lead the professional development core. And as part of that core, we developed a scholar program. And the scholar program has really emphasized the importance of team or interdisciplinary mentoring. It's, and it's emphasized not only in the RFA, but it's emphasized in our regular meetings with trainees, et cetera. We've had nine scholars to date. Um, in the four years the program has been running, seven have graduated with the receipt of external funding. And in total, our trainees, all nine, have had more than 13 million in external funding with more than 7 million coming uh, from grants that led to graduation for our seven of our graduates. Um, our trainees, the nine scholar trainees, have had over 120 publications. 48 invited regional national presentations. And these are all people you know, very early in their academic careers. And so it's been uh, very gratifying to see this model work successfully moving it into our CTR. So I wanna sum up and hopefully quit talking. Um, the VERA has been a robust way, a tool really, if you will, to support rheumatology research training. And it's been a model for other professional development programs, and we've taken this model and successfully implemented it into our NIGMS-funded CTR. Uh, obviously, VERA has been collaborative. It's been a journey for me and I think others who have been involved. It's been a challenge, but it's been lots of fun. And of all the things I do in my day-to-day -day life, uh, directing VERA has been uh, clearly a, among the most gratifying. So I want to end just by saying if you uh, feel gypped that, you know, you couldn't meet someone from Nebraska today in person, uh, first off, I hope meeting you virtually is, is, is a good substitute. But, you know, I, I found this on the web. You can head due east from Raleigh or from Chapel Hill, and there is a town called Nebraska, North Carolina. And uh, it's an unincorporated town on the coast. And so you could probably stay in quarantine and, and in Nebraska and meet a Nebraskan uh, in person. So I want to thank you again for the invitation. I'm happy to take uh, any questions. Thanks, Dr. Michaels. So we do have time for a couple questions, about 10 minutes. So just to remind everybody, you can type your questions into the chat box and I'll read them aloud, or you can unmute yourself and ask your question. So while we're waiting for everyone to kind of think about the questions that they have, um, I have one. So when the VERA registry was first created, kind of what was the goal? Was it just to create a database in the biorepository or was the intention to create a mentoring network something yeah, that was it, part of it? I, you know, and I, I honestly, I think the mentoring part of that really, uh, not necessarily an afterthought, but it really was secondary. I think our intent up front was, you know, we were all very, um, you know, I should speak for myself. I was a very junior investigator at the time that we developed that. And so, you know, my intent was really to develop a multi-center registry that would provide a resource for research. But, they, you know, really quickly became apparent 
um, on how that could be used by trainees. So it was, you know, in our very early existence that fellows began to look at uh, Vera data and use that data for their own abstracts and poster presentations. And the collaborative nature of the group, I think, really supported that. So it's, it is commonplace in this group for PIs from other sites to be directly involved and maybe even the lead mentor for trainees from other sites. And I think that's been fostered by these per, the personal connections we have both with our annual meeting, but we also hold a monthly or bi-monthly uh, webinar and we have trainees present their work and they get direct feedback from more seasoned investigators. So to circle back to your question, I think really goal number one was a research resource. Uh, and then goal two of providing a mentoring platform or a mentoring network really kind of grew out of it, you know, quite naturally. But I think that if I was to do this over and I was to do it now, it would be far more purposeful and it would be an upfront goal uh, rather than waiting. Great. Thanks. And I think um, Beth also had a question. She raised her hand. <laughs> so feel free to start to ask your question, Beth. Um, hey, Ted, thanks so much um, for your talk. This is just beautiful work. And I think on so many levels, we have a lot to learn from what you've done in Nebraska and really around the country. So I really, I thank you for, for coming and, and sharing this with us. Um, a couple of questions I have with respect to um, sort of the the EHR itself and and how the data um, is extracted from the EHR. I think you know we are on the epic platform yeah. God save us um, and um, you know one of the the things that's been sold to us and and many other investigators around the country is is you know our ability to extract data from the EHR. It sounds like the VA system has got a better handle on that. And you mentioned, you know, the, what did you say, about how many 64,000 patients with RA in the VA system, did I get that right? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, your, your cohort really being a small um, subset, obviously, you know, for obvious reasons. Um, but, but maybe you can comment on sort of the integrity of the data and the diagnosis um, and, and how you look at that when you're enrolling patients in the cohort. Yeah, so let me take those. So Beth, great to hear from you, by the way. Um, Beth and I go way back to another <laughs> mentoring network. We go back to the Clear Registry, which was um, you know, many, many years ago and was another important mentoring network that was involved in my early career. And Beth was part of that. So I really appreciate you being on today and asking the question. I, so I, I, I don't know if you saw it, but I kind of chuckled uh, during the, your epic comment. Um, I can't see so, your face. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. So <laughs> I, I did, I, there was a smirk there. So we also have epic. And um, I think while data abstraction should be fairly straightforward, it's not an epic's proprietary best interest to make that easy. Um, and so and I'm, I'm gonna be blunt because that's what way I am. Um, the VA, we have the advantage that is a non-prepared proprietary soft, software that's used for our EHR, at least at present. Um, I don't know if you, how much time you guys spend in the VA, but they are transitioning to a proprietary EHR uh, Cerner. And how that will impact our ability to function is questionable. There are investigators who've been able to get over the epic hurdle at their sites, um, you know, and uh, Caleb Mishu, who is at our UNMC site, is one such investigator who's been able to get at least local data abstracted. Um, I think one of the lessons about epic is that if you've met one epic at one institution, you've met one epic at one institution. So they do not uh, interchange well. Um, and that's, you know, that's been a problem. And I think it's been one of the reasons that the RISE registry supported by the American College of Rheumatology hasn't involved as many academic centers as we'd all like to see, honestly. Um, in terms of data integrity um, in the VA, 
all of the Vera registrants uh, satisfy American College of Rheumatology criteria and are diagnosed by a rheumatologist. So both of those things make me feel very good about the cases we have in the registry. Now nationally, where we use administrative codes to diagnose uh, or, or, excuse me, to classify patients, you do ha certainly have concerns about misclassification, no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. um, but I think they're fairly minimal. So when you do things like two codes separated into time with certain medication dispensing observed, you exclude other forms of autoimmune or connective tissue disease, you know, those algorithms have fairly high positive predictive value and specificities. And so I think, you know, depending on how it's done, you feel pretty good about that data. Um, so I hope I answered your question. Yeah, if I didn't, no. let me know. Thanks, Ted. Appreciate it. So I, there's one question on here, Council, that I see um, from Todd Schwartz that just asks about, you know, lessons learned. You know, it's not all roses, right? So, um, <laughs> And that's absolutely true. And so thanks for asking that question. There's been a lot of different lessons learned. And I would say on the consortium side or the research side, one of the lessons learned is, is that our cohort, the Vera Registry, isn't for all sites, you know, and that's, I think, really evident. Um, so just an example of that, we don't provide, you know, a, a coordinator FTE and that's often the first question from people who are interested in collaborating and research is you know what support can I hope to get and the answer I often give facetiously is well it's a nice round number um, it's you know not much so really you you join Vera not necessarily out of altruism, but you join it because you see the potential for the resource for you locally and for your trainees. And that's not for every site. Um, so that's been probably the biggest lesson learned. Um, you know, I think the other lesson learned is the resources available to different sites to be able to mentor locally very tremendously. And frankly, some have inadequate mentoring available. And so we've really tried to help those trainees as much as possible, but that has its limits for sure. Um, and so, you know, it's, uh, we have struggled with providing adequate mentoring depending on the question, the expertise that might be needed for a given question. I think that certainly has been an issue on, in some cases. Ted, this is Richard Loser. I have a question for you. That was a, a great talk. Um, as you may know, our CCCR has a phenotyping and precision medicine core. And I'm wondering if anyone's doing phenotyping or precision medicine work with your large database and incorporating some of the cytokine results, for example, from the biorepository, um, you know, to look at factors associated with response to therapy or progression of RA or subgroups of RA, you know, there's yeah. seems like a lot that could be done there. Oh my. Yeah. Um, so that's a great question. And I, and one I'm very interested in, and the, I think the quick answer is no, you know, I mean, surprisingly, no, that obviously requires funding and expertise, but it's a great question because it's one I've thought, uh, and it's not great because I thought about it, but it's great because I think it's just spot on. So we have um, a tremendous amount of not only clinical data from, you know, from Vera, but also administrative data, but we also have this now very rich biomarker repository on these patients. So in addition to the cytokine profiling, and this is limited in the sense it's all from enrollment, but in terms of the biomarkers we have, we have, you know, the the multiplex cytokine data, we have autoantibodies on all these patients. We have uh, now, as I mentioned, Josh Baker uh, got funding that supported uh, GWAS. So we have over 600,000 genetic markers on all of these patients. Um, so I think it is ripe for that kind of work. I'm hesitant to offer it up as a way to look at efficacy of treatments, because I think in an observational cohort with a one-time measurement like that, it, that's going to be really tough to do. 
Um, but I certainly think in terms of phenotyping that you are right. And there would be really um, exciting opportunities with some, you know, machine learning approaches, et cetera, that we have not embarked on. We have um, started to go after uh, biomarkers and their association with RA-related ILD. That's been a big interest area for Dr. England, as I mentioned earlier. So we have started down that path, but I think there's a lot of room for questions uh, in the realm that you point out. Well, we do have expertise in our core. Um, I don't want to speak for Amanda Nelson, who's our core director. I think she's on here as well. But, you know, perhaps if you're interested in, in a collaboration, we could have a separate, you know, discussion about, you know, carving out maybe something that would be of interest to you all that, that would be um, possible through our, our CCCR. Yeah, I, I, think I would commit to that right here in public. So that'd be a great conversation to have. I mean, I, uh, um, those conversations are great because they're always learning opportunities. And I, I would love to have that conversation. Great. Okay. Well, we'll be in touch. Okay. Okay. So I'd like to thank you again, Dr. Michaels, for taking the time to talk with all of us today. We're gonna to be sending out a follow-up email to you all in the coming days with a link to access this recording in case you'd like to listen to it again or share it with your colleagues. Prior to everyone leaving this meeting, we're gonna ask you to complete a very brief anonymous poll about the presentation. It should only take about 10 seconds to do. So if you could just take a second, it would help with um, some feedback for our presentations. We'd really appreciate it. And I'll go on and send that out to everybody now. Just a reminder, it is anonymous. And then once you finish it, you're welcome to exit the meeting. And thanks again for attending the talk, everybody. I hope everyone has a wonderful day.